Welcome to LC Screen Talk. My name is Larry, and this is the latest in my Pride Month series of movie reviews. And today, we're discussing the British comedy, Kinky Boots. And to help me discuss this film, I have my friend, Ren, back again for another Pride Month. Hello. <laughs> Usually, you know, we're like side by side in action, but, you know, due to world's crisis and pandemics and such here we are <laughs> it's fine. we're like two miles away from each other right now so <laughs> we are. We're, we're, we're quarantine close yes ren you had seen this film before is that correct mm-hmm. and i rewatched it again today <laughs> <laughs> perfect this is another one i have never seen i don't know i had never watched kinky boots i have this shirt mostly because i live for Brendan Urie, and he played one of the roles on Off Broadway. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> on Broadway, Off Broadway, somewhere. Uh, <laughs> somewhere in New York. I know that. Uh, so authoritative as a theater person and say it was Broadway, Larry, but <laughs> I'm not 100%. I'm pretty sure it was on Broadway. I'm pretty sure it was on Broadway, and then it was like on the West End for a while, and it was like a thing. So I think it was Broadway, like the legit one. <laughs> So yeah, I got this shirt, and thus I was like, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna talk about kinky boots. It doesn't have Brandon in it, but it's still an LGBTQ staple that went on to be a West End and Broadway success as an actual play. Uh, have you actually seen the live show, Ren? I haven't, and I tried to get you to let me do the musical version of it, and you were like, girl. This is a film criticism <laughs> channel, not a theater criticism <laughs> channel. So I have not seen the uh, musical version, but I know it's very popular. I know lots of people really, really like it. Um, and <laughs> not to get too into it immediately, but I imagine the musical is a lot better than the movie because I can't imagine the sort of enthusiasm being for the movie <laughs> itself. Uh, so it was all of the music for the Broadway show was written, or the lyrics at least, were written by Cindy Lauper. So that <laughs> definitely shows you how awesome it probably is. <laughs> I have heard the song. I obviously watched like a clip on uh, YouTube of Brendan doing his like man song. I don't know when he puts on the kinky boots on the stage. Um, so I'm like, oh. I forget we don't have all of those songs in We that. don't have any yeah, there's just the, the drag scene songs. Yeah. There's, there's not like it's not like a musical, you know. So does this have like the same uh, following? Obviously uh, Rocky Horror has more of a watch along whereas I think Hedwig has a watch along but that also has like that kind of cult following. I feel like Kinky Boots has that same kind of enthusiastic cult following, just more for the, the stage play than the film. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I actually so I did a little bit of research on it, and uh, it was I actually didn't know this, but I hadn't realized that the film came out first, and then yeah. the musical came out. It was based on the the musical is written by Harvey Firestein, who is an amazing playwright, super hilarious. So again, I imagine the theater version is probably the next step up. Um, Another gay icon. I mean, yeah. how do you go wrong with Harvey Feinstein and Cindy Lauper? Like, yeah. I mean. <laughs> right, exactly. So I imagine that the musical is like super gay and really, really LGBTQ friendly. And I, I, that's why I imagine it is a popular cult favorite. Yeah, so getting into the film, we do have some younger versions of pretty household names, especially when it comes to British actors these days. A young Chiwetel Ejiofor plays Lola, and then we have Joel Edgerton as our other lead, and this was certainly before either of them became the names we know them as now. So how did you feel about the performances, Ren? She would tell AJ for it. So I like him a lot as an actor. He has moments in it, um, but he is not a drag queen. And <laughs> that was just like too hard for me to watch. Yeah. You know, I think uh, the movie itself kind of depended on Lola being a fabulous, amazing drag queen. And she wasn't. Well, that's like, the thing. So we have, you know, Broadway. We had Billy Porter in the yeah. role of Lola. We even had, like, Todrick Hall, who was yeah. fabulous and wonderful in these type of yeah. things. Yeah. So, you know, 
Chiwetel, I think, is a very good actor. Yeah. And, and I do think, especially with a lot of the more emotional stuff where mm-hmm. Lola needs to be humanized, I think he does really well, a lot of the talking. But when we get those drag moments, certainly every now and then he's kind of cute. Like when he enters into the... Um, the shoe factory unannounced I thought was fun oh but like the actual performances themselves you were like oh yeah. you're headlining your own like club scene girl <laughs> so normally the thing that I, I think I love about drag films and I think the thing that like brought me into the world of drag is the fabulousness of it right it's the amazing makeup and the gorgeous costumes and the fine attention to performance and this the, the wigs were bad. He didn't have blocked out eyebrows. His costume didn't fit him very well, and it was like nobody bothered to talk to a drag queen, like a real drag queen, before they filmed this movie. Because you know, and this, this is, I think this is probably the biggest crime for me of the entire film is the whole thing is about fabulous boots and women walking, you know, men being able to wear beautiful, fabulous boots. And it is very clear that he cannot walk in heels. Like, he is lumbering. <laughs> he has got none of that. You know, I, I don't want to, like, be a gatekeeper about what drag is and is not. But at the very least, it seems like when you have a gay persona, uh, excuse me, a drag persona, that you want to create a whole character. And so that should come in through your whole body. But Lola doesn't change between when they're dressed as a man or when they're dressed as a drag queen. The the body is exactly the same. He sits exactly the same. And, you know, it's like I felt like I was a judge on Drag Race and was like, give me body. Your padding is terrible what is this your figure your shape is no good get a better wig you're styling oh my god honey your makeup like that's what i felt like was it was just constantly not quite like it was just not on point right and and i i imagine it seems like maybe this is a really low budget film and maybe they didn't have the budget for it but I, again i feel like at the very least they maybe should have talked to a drag queen about it right because like I think about uh, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. That was also a very low budget film. Australian and... production. This is British yeah. cinema, so they have yeah. more of a budget than most Australian companies. <laughs> <laughs> and and Priscilla, Queen of the Desert had amazing oh. co- costumes. You know, the Birdcage, amazing costumes. It was made even earlier than that. And I think the Birdcage, again, had a bigger uh, production budget. But um, yeah, I just felt like I feel like if you're going to make a movie about drag queens, you need some drag queens. I need to see it, right? That's what I want. And yeah. I, that that was one of always the kind of the thing for me is when you suggest a kinky booth, I was like, yeah, sure, we can talk about it. Because yeah. I just remember seeing it and being like, meh, it was okay. That was fine. <laughs> and now, like, actually looking at it with a critical eye, I was like, oh, my God, I can't. He's not, like, <laughs> having watched it, like, I don't know, 10 years later and, like, 12 seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race later, I'm like, oh, this is not acceptable. <laughs> How did you feel everything. about Joe Edgerton in our lead role? Uh, you know, I don't think the acting was bad so much as like, just the characters don't make a lot of sense, and I don't have a lot of reason to like them or follow along with them and, like, care about them. Right? Like, he... <sighs> You kind of, like, love a little bit. You're like, oh, okay, he's going to choose to do this yeah. this thing, and he's going to save the factory, and, okay, we care about him, but then he's like, I'm going to go ahead and mortgage my house without telling my fiancé I'm going to not involve her in any of these life decisions that affect her, and then she's supposed to be this villain, um, and she's also a very one-dimensional villain, so I'm like, you know, I have no way of, really feeling about them as a couple like it, it's clear that it's not a great situation right like you can yeah. telegraph from the very beginning that this is his girlfriend and she clearly wants things that he does not really care about uh, you know like from the first moment that they're in their northampton apartment and she's all excited or their london apartment and she's all excited about it because it's not Horn- northampton you like immediately see in his little face that he doesn't really care he's like doing this for her yeah um, and so it's telegraphed pretty quickly that he doesn't care about this person. So then I'm not invested at all in the rest of 
their relationship or his love interest that is at the factory, this other little girl who, again, it doesn't get developed. Um, it is interesting. I think I, I noticed, obviously, that this did not pass the Bechdel test at all, uh, that yeah. none of the women talk to each other about anything. Um, it's just uh, a drag queen and um, and Joel Edgerton's character, and uh, we kind of just follow them. Yeah, we just had that little girl bopping around. Uh, oh, gosh, and you know me. The love story part, I was just like, eh, I could do without all of this, honestly. Yeah. The whole thing could just be thrown out, but that's me with like 80% of films. I'm like, eh, we could just throw out this love story and yeah. give that time to other things in the film and I'd be happy. <laughs> yeah, agreed. The, the love story was, you know, it's, it's an older movie. I mean, it's certainly clear that it was one of those situations where it was like, we have to have a love story. You can't tell, you can't have a movie without a love story, obviously. So they like included this thing that's like completely inconsequential to the rest of it. Uh, it's interesting. So like him mortgaging his house to save the factory or what have you is supposed to paint him as a hero, um, which let me tell everybody right now, do not mortgage your house for your business. This is a terrible idea. Don't do it. Especially without discussing with your significant other Especially first. Especially with that, right? And so that's the thing is like, oh, he's like, I'm supposed to feel like he's the hero for putting his entire life savings, his mortgage on his house at home yeah. on the line for this. But then I also think he's kind of an asshole because he didn't tell his girlfriend about it at all. Um, and also, I think this, you know, I, I thought, I think the film just suffers from a lack of creativity in the screenwriting. Yeah. Um, you know, like almost everything is revealed accidentally. Like everything is like, I oops, I turned on the speaker, and now everybody in the factory hears this information they need to know, but we were didn't have a reason for them to know it yet. And oh, girlfriend didn't know things except people keep randomly, accidentally telling her these things. Even if we needed the love story, the love story doesn't like tell me anything. I don't care about any of it. Like, they don't really feed into any of it. I don't know why Lauren likes him. I don't know why the fiancé doesn't like him or does like him or what, you know, like, there's just no stakes with it. So, again, like, could totally do without it, except the rest of the movie isn't that great either. Yeah, and it feels very British. It definitely, it felt like kind of one of those little fun, innocuous oh. British comedies. That's kind of how I felt. I don't know. It had the British, British look. Movies. It, it had the British look to it. I don't know. It had the British pacing to it. I, yeah. I feel like a lot of British comedies, particularly, have this atmosphere and feel to them. The pacing, yeah. the look, the the comedy style is obvious. You know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I. You know, I really. I'm a lot of those. A lot of those background actors working in the factory. I was like, oh wait. Uh, <laughs> The same, I've, yeah. seen, I've seen you in how many British films? In every, yeah, exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. But so, but I will say that I'm a big fan of British comedy. I watch a lot of British shows. I've seen a lot of British movies. I lived in London for a semester. Like I'm, a, you know, living with my half British boyfriend with his British mom. I'm invested in the British culture. Um, but this just, movie just wasn't that funny. Like that was the thing is it's touted as a comedy, and I don't think I really laughed at all throughout the entire movie yeah. like there's a few cute little moments that make you go ha, that's about all it got out of me was it <laughs> 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 you know? how do you feel about those the, the iconic red boots ran um i, I do I, that's probably my favorite part of the whole movie is uh when lola gets the moment of saying <laughs> burgundy <laughs> Yeah, that oh red <laughs> sex. Yes. That is the, sex. Yes, that is like the moment, and it's it's ridiculous too. Like in the context of the rest of the movie, in the context of the rest of the character, it doesn't make any sense. But as a moment, I live for it. Right? Like I would have preferred if Lola was that character the whole <laughs> time. Right? Like that. That's what's that. That is a drag queen. Yeah. That is the most drag queen moment in the entire movie. And you actually see him performing at a drag club. So, like, yeah, that's amazing. And I, and I love the boots. I mean, I, I love the boots on uh, Joel Edgerton when it, he's just got his little, like, suit on. Yeah, like and, this, like, this little outfit, basically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's adorable. I like that. Um, 
<laughs> and little tiny white. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I like the boots. I didn't think they were amazing. I don't know. I think I've always kind of thought that the kinky boots were like, eh, like they're theoretically sexy, but they're also like, yeah. It's hard. I don't know. I think sexy. I like to see ankles and yeah. a lot more like leg. And I think boots, you know, what was it? She actually explained it in the movie about how the heel makes the calf uh, oh, yeah. tight and the butt look hurt. And so like if the boot is covering all of that, then it's not as sexy. Yeah. So the heel. <laughs> the heel, the heel yeah, yeah. Tight. And, and I, I like the idea of you know, it was very cute to see him with his little nails drawing all of his little um, designs for the boots. And, and I, I wish, I don't know, I think there's elements of the movie that could have been explored more and just kind of like lived inside of it. I think I would have maybe enjoyed the movie a lot more if we lived a little bit more inside the relationship between Joel Edgerton's character and um, Lola's character, where we just kind of like watch them get to know each other. A little bit but also, more. and I, I think that's my ultimate takeaway from the film. I thought it was, like, like I kind of mentioned earlier, an innocuous, fine, just kind of like pass the time, crowd pleaser, you know, yeah. pretty generic film overall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because you even get the, like, you get the romance, and then you get that story beat that didn't need to happen either, the, where he goes off on her about, yeah. like, embarrassing him, and she wasn't a man, she wasn't a woman, make right. a choice. Like, that whole thing didn't it's, need uh, to happen. It just yeah. didn't need to happen. It's and the, Well, it's the hero's journey, right? Yeah. Like, every single yeah. point on the hero's journey, and if you don't hit that point where he r- tries to ruin everything and then gets to have his redemption arc, yeah. then you haven't followed the exact format that you're supposed <laughs> to follow to write a sh- yeah. yeah yeah totally and it like doesn't make any sense right like he already doesn't like his girlfriend it's been made very clear that he doesn't like the fiance and like i guess we're supposed to kind of understand that he attacks lola because he's hurt about yeah. basically realizing that his girl but like that doesn't make me like him it makes me think that he's again just kind of an asshole like <laughs> a well-rounded good person would have said listen my girlfriend's cheating on me i'm pretty sure i gotta yeah. go um but it kind of led into this very weird thing and again i think my other issue with the movie is the issue that i kind of have with a lot of earlier drag films like to wong fu at least in to wong fu the costumes are fantastic and the actors are selling it but <laughs> <laughs> and it was also made about 10 years prior to this so yes. there was 10 years for us to have growth yes so uh, there is this confluence uh this confusion and this um this sort of uh, they're they're basically trying and make being a tr- being trans being a transvestite and being a drag queen all the same thing yeah. um and i know they tried in- to make some sort of differentiation like i don't know it was weird he was like not only am i a transvestite but i am also a drag queen but he has that kind he, of talk to her and it was kind of like, early in the movie he's like i'm a drag queen a transvestite yeah. is he basically insinuated that a transvestite is like just a man that puts on a wig and like looks like a man they're almost playing with the idea of like being non-binary yeah. But even the like they don't even like make a solid choice. Yeah. On, you know, it's like oh, if you're half man and half woman, that's fine. Or you know, if you're yeah. a woman or a man, or you haven't quite decided, right? But then when they say oh, you haven't quite decided, then that again yeah. goes back into that idea that like you have to pick, you have to decide. Yeah. Which is something we've kind of moved away from in more recent years. So. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like there was a lot of ideas in this that were like these sort of crumbs of things that you could like that were still kind of covered in early 2000s misunderstandings of what being drag, what drag was, what being trans yeah. was. Um, and they were, and it, and it sucked because it was like they were trying to deal with it, but they didn't actually talk to anybody that knew. Yeah. If this were made in 2020, I think we could maybe iron out a lot of that. But yeah. back in the mid 2000s. Uh, they just weren't ready to have that conversation. And they, yeah. like you said, they didn't put in the work to, to establish that discussion. Yeah. Or explain it to us, right? Is he trans? Is he a transvestite? Is he a drag queen? Is he struggling with his gender identity? Is, is that the question that we're talking about? Is that the real issue? Or is it just that he should be able to be something in between? Like, it just, it, it's so muddy, the, like... Yeah. 
message that it's trying to say. I think that was the thing that frustrated me about the movie is, right, it's not really funny enough to be a comedy. It's also not really, like, deep enough to be a feel-good sort of story. It's just, it's so... Yep. Middle of the road, meh. I don't. I just don't know what to do with it. Yeah, and it's another one of those films where, where it's. I mean, it. He is our main character, but the only sort of relationshipy stuff we do focus on is of the heterosexual white dude at the front. Yeah. You know, we don't. Yeah. You know, I. I think I might be able to be more on board if it was Lola. You know, having a, a relationship problem on the side or something. Um, yeah. Because if you're going to bring up this topic, then I'd rather see that. But it was definitely another one that was like, okay, yeah. we're, we're going to have the community in here and, and not really well, have to, uh, It was also strange too, right? Because they also make it very clear that he is straight. Um, there's like a conversation that he has with somebody in the factory where he's like, if you want to sleep with women, then why are you dressing like a woman? And like, like it's frustrating, right? It felt It felt a little bit like it was an intentional erasure of homosexuality in the movie right like oh, I, didn't, I, didn't even, I don't even know if i caught that conversation i saw him dressing that guy up who then wore the boots at the end that like large dude uh yeah. he was giving him like womanly advice but yeah. i i guess i didn't hear him say that yeah so the, and that right and that, so then that makes it very strange as well where it's like what are you trying to say what are the screenwriters even trying to say what you know your job as a director your job as a screenwriter is to tell a story and i just don't i don't think they told a story i think they threw a bunch of lines out there and an interesting character and and the you know they're just lucky they cast some really amazing actors yeah that you know even though he was a terrible drag performer, I still yeah. like him as an actor. I still like him as and an actor. He still found yeah ways to endure you, endear you to yeah. uh, Lola as a as a character overall. Yeah. Plus, I think the screenplay also takes a shortcut just in conventional ways. Ever, nobody ever has to really reconcile with their actions everybody's forgiven very easily for everything yeah. um including the the main owner of the shoe store i mean the way he went off on that woman and she just kind of is like so happy and forgiving right afterward i don't know the the guy in the arm wrestling thing uh, he's forgiven like that and then of course at the end obviously that i mean what he said to lola was pretty horrible like it was a, that's, i think that's the problem is they just went so far with how he went off on her yeah that i was like i mean that message that you sent doesn't quite make up for it. I, I actually yeah. wish Lola had just been like, I yeah. came here because these, I've made a connection with these people and they put a ton of work into this and I didn't want to let them down. Yeah. But you're still trash and yeah. move out of my way. Like that's yeah. how that last conversation should have yeah. went. You know? well, it, was, it was frustrating too. I think I realized that it was, um, it, it's that idea of labor and Lola was expected to do all of the emotional labor for everyone. She had to make excuses for everyone's bullshit and and you know I I that idea in films is you know a bit antiquated <laughs> as far as like in film time that we should be expecting the people who are being oppressed to have endless amounts of patience in their attempt to convince everyone that they are a human deserving of respect and love just like everyone else. But according and, to the Academy, you know, Green Book. <laughs> This happened two years ago, so I don't know how antiquated it is. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I, I definitely see how this could be a fun show, and I would still, if anything, it did intrigue me even more so yeah. to be like, I do want to see a production of Kinky Boots because absolutely, all of the ingredients are there. Like mm-hmm. every aspect is there to put together something really fun, mm-hmm. really a great time that mm-hmm. could open up those discussions. It's just, unfortunately, the film didn't quite know how to assemble the pieces to bring it to the screen. I don't think it's a horrible film. I don't think it's bad, per se. I just think it's a very yeah. forgettable it's, uh, well, it's like a 56% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, and I think that's about right. Yeah. It's right. It's fine. It's fine. innocuous. Just yeah. kind of turn it on. It's there. You'll forget about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I was glad I had already seen it so I could like scroll on my phone a little bit while I was watching it and didn't have to pay too close attention, right? Even even the first time you watch it, you don't really have to pay that close attention because the plot's pretty formulaic. Like beginning to end, you you know what's happening. But don't be a fallout. You know that this relationship, the first time you meet him, is gonna be doomed. You know, the whole yeah. deal. Is- <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as you meet a cute the other young girl, only cute young girl in the entire movie, obviously that's the new love interest. Yeah. Uh, it's very clear. <laughs> I loved that little old man, though. I wish she had spent more time with him. The one who like came those up- were the moments that made me smile was the cute little old dude. That those were like the few times I was like, "Well, oh, that's cute." <laughs> and it is such an interesting concept because even now, and there are stores dedicated to drag shoes and drag clothing because yeah. you know it's still a problem to yeah. find women's shoes in the proper size so did you have did you read about the true story that it's based on uh i just i know it was based on a true story but i didn't really delve too far into it so i i just read a little bit about it it's basically there was a shoe factory and uh they were doing very poorly because they make very very cheap shoes and we've turned into a very uh consumer uh consumption and disregarding sort of society right like we want a thing and then we want to wear it for a season and throw it away Um, so cheap Chinese shoes are the way to go. You have to keep on going and buy them. So they basically ran out, uh, these factories out of town, out of business. Um, and then, uh, they were about to close down. This guy had just taken over. It wasn't like, oh, my father died and now I have to go take over. It was like, he just worked at the shoe factory, worked his way up. And then the shoe factory was doing poorly. And he got a call from a trans woman uh, who ran a, a kinky boutique shop in London and was looking for boots for oh. that were women style boots, but were strong enough to hold a man. And that's about the old, like Lola is not a character in the real story. There's no like fabulous drag queen that is uh paint you know creating these things and that i think so i think knowing the true story um was part of what made me realize very clearly they had not actually incorporated a a person who does drag or a trans person or talked to anybody that could have told them what this character should have been like or could have given them an idea so they had no basis in reality they just invented kind of a caricature which made them feel more comfortable with yeah the character they were creating, I guess, you know, make make it, oh, he's not gay. You know, I, I watched a, a play once, according to this play that I had seen, uh, it's called Casa Valentina, if anybody wants to see it. Um, it was about uh, a group of transvestite men um, that would go and have basically a transvestite retreat. And um, they very explicitly would not associate themselves with being gay at all. They needed to make it clear that they were not homosexual because they wanted their rights as transvestites. But if they were associated with homosexuals, then they would lose all their credibility. Um, And so I, I feel a little touch of that in this film, that like to kind of take away his sexuality and make him... Uh, he's a straight transvestite who is struggling with his uh, decision if he wants to be a man or a woman. And sometimes he's a man, he's somebody who's a woman. And, uh, you know, it, it was very loose. Um, but anyway, back to the true story. Uh, the factory actually failed after like five years. Um, it was successful for a hot second um, because of the boots. And then uh, it failed anyways because uh, they made amazing boots. And then people copied them. And <laughs> oh, that's what happened. <laughs> Yes, this is our latest drag style film review that I brought Ren on board with, Miss Bio Queen herself, Ren, here. So uh, thank you so much, Ren, for joining me yet again, even if it is via screen as we are now. My moment to celebrate Pride because <laughs> we didn't get to go to Pride this I year. Oh, I know. Everything Pride related is via computer screen this year. Um, <laughs> Woo! So why don't you let people know where they can find you and Audacious on the internet? Uh, so uh, Audacious Theater is my uh, is my theater company. Uh, you can like us on Facebook. Uh, it is uh, you know Audacious Theater, like the word Audacious. Um, I am on Twitter. Ha <laughs> ha! 
I just joined Twitter recently. Uh, <laughs> so you can follow me. I'm at Ren Manley. Um, and uh, you can also uh, visit our website, Audacious Theater, uh, audaciousTheater.com. Uh, that's about it. Wonderful, everyone, especially if you are in the Denver area, please make sure that you head on over, subscribe to the newsletter, follow Audacious's Facebook and Instagram, and also make sure to follow Rand's personal Facebook, I mean, not Facebook. My make Twitter. Sure to, <laughs> make sure to follow Rand's personal Twitter. Hot takes will be pouring, I'm sure. I hope you all did enjoy this review. If you did, please hit that like button down below and subscribe to the channel so you are always up to date on my latest videos if you are looking for more pride related content i do have all of my pride month reviews up on a pride celebration playlist on my homepage. so go check that out so i love you all so much for your continued support thank you for watching and i'll see you next time bye, bye.